Early in the 1980s, a charismatic leader arose in Miami. Why art thou so far? He drew the weak, the poor, and the powerless to his side. He promised them a better life, but they had to follow his commands to earn it. His temples soon sprouted across the country as thousands were drawn to his gospel. When those who questioned his doctrine started turning up dead, local police and the FBI had to stop him. Friday, November 13th, 1981, Miami, Florida. On the outskirts of the city, a construction foreman was checking his work site. On a dirt road, he came upon something wrapped in blankets. It was a body. He called police. Detectives from Miami-Dade responded. The foreman said he hadn't seen the body when he passed by earlier that morning. The body must have been laid there recently. The detectives inspected the remains. It was an African-American male. He had been decapitated. Detectives found only a set of keys on the victim. There was no wallet or identification. Four feet away, detectives found the victim's head wrapped in sheets. His fingerprints were taken in the hopes that they might help identify the man. Decapitations are rare, usually performed to hide a murder victim's identity. According to Detective John King, that wasn't the motive here. There was no attempt to hide or prevent identification because they left the, the head actually on the scene. Usually, if you're going to try to prevent an identification from being made, you would take other body parts, such as the hands or the head also. It seems like it was more ritualistic than anything else, uh, how he was killed. The victim's face was badly damaged. Visual identification would be difficult. And unless the man's fingerprints were on record, investigators would have no way of identifying him from his prints. Perhaps the autopsy could tell them more. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been severely beaten before his decapitation. His nose was bloodied, his teeth were broken, and his eyes were swollen shut. His wrist showed ligature marks, and sneaker tread marks on his body suggested he'd been kicked. On the back of his neck, the medical examiner found evidence of repeated blows from a dull blade. It had been a large weapon, perhaps a machete. Comparing the victim's fingerprints wouldn't be easy. In 1981, the database wasn't computerized. Features of the print had to be compared manually against thousands in arrest files. Eventually, 
one investigator hit the mark. The victim's name was Aston Green, age 25. He had been arrested a month earlier for a misdemeanor driving charge in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, we got a match. They found no history of violent crime. Detectives went to Aston Green's last known address, his mother's house. My son? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you maybe help us out by telling us... After informing son? Mrs. Green of her son's death, detectives asked her about Aston. She said her son had recently turned to religion. He seemed very serious about it. She'd last seen him two weeks earlier. She prepared a vegetarian meal for him in accordance with his new religious beliefs. So tell me what has been, what's going on with you? What are you doing? They talked about his conversion. He explained he was a Hebrew Israelite, a Yahweh. She told investigators that his son was committed to his Yahweh beliefs. That's when we first heard the word Yahweh. I had no idea what the Yahweh was all about. I never heard the name before. I knew nothing about them. Aston Green's mother didn't know his new address, though she did have a phone number. She said he had a housemate, but didn't know his name. From the phone number, detectives determined Green's new address, about 12 miles from downtown Miami. Due to the violent nature of the murder, they called for backup before approaching the house. No one answered. Perhaps Green's housemate had been harmed too. Detectives decided to enter the house. The key they found in Green's pocket fit the lock. We entered the house uh, thinking that hopefully we wouldn't find any other bodies, but we went in to check it out. We found a number of items of a religious nature, uh, textbooks, workbooks, a lot of literature. Uh, it turned out that it was from the Hebrew Israelite religion. There was no sign of the housemate. We also found a, a machete that was tucked to the side of one of the sofas in the residence. Uh, we immediately became interested in the machete because that could be a weapon to decapitate somebody. The machete appeared to be clean. Yeah. Investigators continued their search. Hello. By the door, they found a phone number. They traced it to a house two miles away. Hi, I'm Detective Christopher. This is Detective King. Can we talk to you for a few minutes? At the house, the detectives talked with a group of Hebrew Israelites. I'm sorry I had to inform you, but... Among them was Aston Green's housemate, Carlton Carey. All of them knew Green through the Yahweh Temple. They told investigators that Green, like themselves, had grown disillusioned with the rigid social doctrine of the temple. Can you tell me something about I've seen him in temple battle. To them, adherence to the temple's leader was at too high a price. Their colored turbans signified their desire to break away from it. We spoke to them briefly. Uh, we got a little bit of background information on the temple and what it was all about. And we asked them to respond to the homicide office so that we could take uh, statements and uh, uh, in-depth interviews with them about what happened and what they knew. Several suggested that the killers were probably zealous members of the Yahweh Temple who wanted to silence those who questioned the doctrine. Most were afraid to say more, especially to police. They were already branded dissenters. They feared any further disobedience could be punished by death. Well, all the people that we spoke to perceived a great deal of danger because of threats that had been made to them um, 
both on the phone and by word of mouth from other members that were still in the organization. They were concerned for their safety, and uh, the death of Aston Green certainly confirmed this. The next day, Green's housemates came to the police station to talk. Despite the threat, Carlton Carey and his wife wanted to help. His wife was interviewed in a separate room at the station. Carey said that he and Green had embraced the temple until recently when its leader, Hulon Mitchell, started calling himself the true messiah. The charismatic leader of the temple, Hulon Mitchell, believed that blacks were descended from the lost Hebrew tribe of Judah. As followers of Mitchell, members abandoned their given names. They took a biblical first name and adopted the last name of Israel. Mitchell did not allow dissent among his followers. Mitchell eventually changed his name to Yahweh ben Yahweh, which means God, son of God. In fact, during the uh, interview we had with him, he referred to Hulin as not the Messiah, but a crook and a swindler, which was his characterization of Hulin Mitchell at that time. Kerry still had reservations about talking to police. Detectives offered to escort him home. He declined, opting to leave with his wife alone. When they left the homicide office that night, they didn't want to be escorted because any police being with them would be further uh, attraction to anybody that saw them, and they were concerned about being seen with anybody. Uh, they didn't want us to escort them home. Carrie and his wife took a winding route home to make sure no one had followed them. They never suspected someone to be waiting inside. As Miami police investigated the beheading of a dissident member of a religious group, two informants were ambushed in their home. Carlton Carey had been shot to death. His wife, Mildred Banks, had also been shot, then her throat was slashed. She barely clung to life. Like the beheading victim, the two were dissident members of the Hebrew Israelites. At the scene, police found a bloodied machete. Detective John King believed a similar weapon had been used in the earlier beheading. The fact that a machete was actually used in an attempt on Mildred's life certainly gave more credence to the belief that uh, the uh, Hebrew Israelites were involved in it. Detectives learned that many members of the Hebrew Israelite movement owned machetes. Police searched the house. Nothing found at the scene indicated who was responsible for the assault. Whoever the killers were, they had cut the phone line and left no physical trace of themselves behind. Detectives' only hope was Mildred Banks. If doctors could save her, perhaps she could name her attackers. Mildred was uh, very seriously injured as a result of the attack on her. She was shot in the chest, the bullet was still in her, and she had a deep gash to the left side of her neck. Uh, she was given a very low probability of surviving those injuries. Police waited several days to see if she would survive surgery. Without her description of events, investigators had little hope of solving the case. Mildred Banks pulled through. When she was conscious, investigators visited her in the recovery room.
Though critically wounded, she was able to answer questions from the police. She said that she and her husband had driven by their house several times to be sure no one had followed them. They saw no one, so they went inside. She was certain that her attackers were Yahweh's, sent because they had spoken to police that day. She never saw their faces. We were concerned that uh, they may actually make an attempt on her at the hospital, so we posted two police officers at all times with her throughout her stay at the hospital. They were there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for approximately one month. The message of this most recent attack was clear to dissenting members of the Yahweh Temple. Those who spoke out or cooperated with police would suffer reprisals. After the homicide of Carlton Carey, we were not able to locate any of the former members that had split from the temple. They had fled in different directions. They became scared and they just left. Detective King needed to learn more about the Yahweh organization. He and his partner visited its Miami temple. We tried interviewing people, and we really got nowhere. Every time we spoke to somebody, it was praise Yahweh or you know, see the uh, public information office at the temple. Through a spokesperson, Hulon Mitchell, the Yahweh leader, claimed to know nothing about the murders and offered no help. Suspecting he knew more, investigators began surveillance on the Yahweh Enterprise. The surveillance was a, sort of a constant rolling type surveillance where you'd drive by, write down some tag numbers. But to actually sit off and watch the place, it was impossible because uh, at all times there were guards standing outside the temple watching the front door. Detectives did learn that the Yahweh organization was extensive. In Florida and in 13 other states, the Yahweh's owned real estate, buses, and vehicles that the leader claimed totaled nearly $50 million. Some said membership topped 12,000 in Florida alone. Most of these people are hardworking professionals that really didn't believe in a lot of what Hewlett and Mitchell was teaching. Uh, certainly, they were not racist to the level that he was, and uh, they were not believing much of what he was telling them about him being the Messiah. Uh, they did, however, believe much of what the religion itself taught, you know, surrounding Judaism and the, the Muslim religion. Since the Yahweh organization spanned several states, the FBI began investigating. Supervisory Special Agent Herbert Cousins was assigned as case agent. He believed the organization demonstrated elements of domestic terrorism. Domestic terrorism investigations are conducted in a group of individuals who engage in criminal activities to further their social or political goal. Local and federal investigators look deeper into the organization. Why art thou so far from helping me? Hulon Mitchell invited the homeless, the destitute, and the ex-con to join his Hebrew Israelites. The Lord shall swallow them up. The People with no job or family found a place to belong, receiving food, shelter, and employment. This kindness didn't reflect Mitchell's underlying mission. He taught that blacks, as the true Jewish people, had a crucial role. He told his followers that their duty was to bring about heaven on earth by destroying the white oppressors. To his most avid followers, Yahweh ben Yahweh was the Messiah, and everything they had belonged to him, including their labor. To, the 
To raise revenue, the Yalways manufactured and packaged their own hair care products, tonics, beverages, t-shirts, wine, and more. The merchandise was shipped to his network of temples all over the country. Yahweh required his members to reach certain income goals for their temple by selling these wares. In turn, the temple fed and sheltered them, and even educated their children. Despite the allegations of violence and his thinly veiled message of hate, Mitchell's temple continued to prosper and spread. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs, the general public was unclear about Mitchell's true intentions. The Yahweh's in the early 80s had, had been amassing power and property, and they had a, a kind of a dual reputation. People saw them as a, as a somewhat scary group that they knew were preaching hatred and violence. But at the same time, they outwardly appeared to be uh, quiet, uh, well-behaved, mannered, uh, and they would go in and buy these properties in dis distressed neighborhoods and actually clean them up. Not everyone welcomed their presence in the neighborhood. In May 1986, people in Delray, Florida drove them out. At around 2 a.m. the same night, the neighborhood was firebombed. The fire destroyed the entire block and injured one adult and three children, including a nine-month-old infant. Police suspected Yahweh members were responsible. One officer recalled an incident that happened in the area about an hour before the bombing. While cruising the neighborhood, he spotted some men dressed in black standing near a van. The area reeked of gasoline. The men seemed suspicious, but they weren't doing anything illegal. They claimed they were having engine trouble. He took down the license plate number and left. Police determined that the van was registered to an elder at the Yahweh Temple. Hulon Mitchell denied any involvement in the firebombing attack. One of his followers was more cooperative. We were able to develop an informant who actually walked into the FBI, who provided information regarding the group. The informant confirmed investigators' suspicions that Mitchell's henchmen were responsible for the firebombing. But he had no direct evidence. He then gave agents information about another crime. He confessed that he had participated in the slaying of Aston Green, the man found beheaded on a dirt road. He said that the dead man had been considered a threat since he openly questioned Hulon Mitchell's authority. Green was abducted from the temple and severely beaten. All right, head back to the van. Head back to the, van. the informant drove him there, and another member carried out Mitchell's order to behead him. All right, let's go, let's go! Get out of here, let's go! Why should we believe? The information was crucial but limited. Investigators still had no physical evidence tying Hulon Mitchell to Green's murder. Authorities would have to carefully build trust among the ex-members. Detective John King re-interviewed Mildred Banks, the woman who had been ambushed in her home. In following up from the information with Woodside, I made contact with uh, Mildred Banks. and. Uh, she turned me on to an individual that uh, was a former member of the organization that might be able to assist me. Uh, I subsequently made contact with that person who took me around to a number of locations where former uh, members resided. As investigators continued their search for a witness courageous enough to come forward, 
Miami police received more disturbing news. A murder victim was found in his car with both ears cut off. Police wondered if this ritualistic killing could be related to the machete attacks. In September of 1986, as FBI and Miami police investigated the leader of the Yahweh's, Hulon Mitchell, police responded to another bizarre murder. 61-year-old Raymond Kelly was found stabbed to death in his vehicle. Both ears had been severed. One was recovered at the scene. Police believed the killer took the other. Metro-Dade Homicide Lieutenant Rex Remley's squad worked the case. In the Dade County area, we had experienced a number of cases in which victims had been murdered and there was an ear missing. In several of those cases, it appeared that it may be the same perpetrator that had committed the crime. To investigators, it looked as if Kelly had been drinking just prior to his death. Detectives collected several sets of prints from the vehicle. But what investigators found missing from the car held greater importance. According to the victim's wife, he always kept a 38 revolver in his glove compartment. Now it was gone. The gun's serial number was entered into the National Crime Information Computer. If the gun turned up anywhere in the country, Miami-Dade police would be notified. Weeks later, police in Opalaka, a suburb of Miami, responded to emergency calls from residents of an apartment complex. It was an apartment complex that had recently been taken under siege, for lack of a better term, by the Yahweh's. Tenants who lived there called it the Dirt Road Apartments. A low-income housing project, some local residents considered it an eyesore. Many were delighted when the Yahweh leader Hulon Mitchell bought the property. Dirt Road residents were not. Unfortunately for the residents, their idea of taking the building over was to actually move the residents out and sometimes, according to the residents, that was by force, where the Yahweh's would actually come into their apartments and remove furniture and belongings while the people objected but had no real way to stop these individuals. The Yahweh's strong arm eviction efforts made the TV news. One resident, Anthony Brown, was particularly outspoken. I'm going to stay here until I get eviction notice. I don't care what they say. I do, because they ain't going in. He cursed the Yahweh's leader, Hulon Mitchell. Investigators knew that Mitchell didn't tolerate public criticism. Witnesses told police the tensions at the apartments continued after night fell. That evening, violence erupted and two men were killed. Police responded to the double murder. They chased one of two suspects in the shooting. A canine unit tracked down the man. The suspect carried nothing in his pockets except two bullets. Nearby, police recovered a 38 caliber revolver. It was not the murder weapon. Police cross-checked its serial number in the crime computer but found no match. The suspect was arrested and taken to the Opalaka police station. Metro-Dade Lieutenant Rex Remley interviewed him there. 
I was just trying to get his basic information was that he had told me that he was near Raya, Israel, and when I asked him about his age, he told me that he was over 400 years old. So that, that's the type of individual that I was dealing with. The name he gave was a Yahweh name, and police found Yahweh clothing in the car he had used to flee. Police suspected that he had been sent to silence those who had spoken out against the Yahwehs. A fingerprint match revealed that the suspect's real name was Robert Rozier. He had spent time in prison for burglary and car theft. Lieutenant Remley also learned that he was a former football player in the National Football League. He then began to have problems after he had left his football career. He had a history that went from crimes in Maryland to crimes in San Francisco area to crimes in Dade County. So he had an extensive past. Rozier's arrest marked the first time an active member of Hulon Mitchell's group was caught at a crime scene. Though they could only charge Rozier with loitering and prowling, authorities suspected he was guilty of much more. Miami police looked for more information from residents who lived nearby the complex. Most residents were reluctant, but several came forward. We were able to determine that Mr. Rozier had in fact been involved in chasing Mr. Brown across the field. He was present. It was our feeling when the shots were fired where Mr. Brown was killed and that he had also attempted to flee from the scene. He was charged that morning with the murder of Mr. Brown. Lieutenant Remley still wondered about the handgun found at the time of Rozier's arrest. It was a 38 revolver, the same type missing from the car of murder victim Raymond Kelly. Though a computer check failed to match the guns, Lieutenant Remley pulled Raymond Kelly's file just to be sure. There had to be more of a story to this gun. And I finally found the documents that had been provided by the family that showed the serial number of this gun. When I checked it, I was amazed to see that it was the exact same gun that we had impounded at Opalaka that night. Unfortunately, when the gun had been entered into the computer, the, one of the digits had been displaced in some way. And therefore, when we ran the gun found at the scene of the murder in Opalaka, it did not show as being Raymond Kelly's stolen weapon. Robert Rozier was now connected to the murder of Raymond Kelly. Prints lifted from Kelly's vehicle matched Rozier's. His fingerprint was found at another slashed year murder as well. Investigators had enough evidence to charge him with two slashed year murders and the double murder at the Dirt Road Apartments. Rozier found himself facing four first-degree murder charges and very likely the death penalty. As Miami investigators tried to close in on Yahweh leader Hulon Mitchell, they arrested a man suspected of being one of Mitchell's enforcers. Robert Rozier sat behind bars facing four capital murder charges. Investigators hoped Rozier would turn on the leader. The Yahwehs and their organization became the target of public scrutiny. Hulon Mitchell, their leader, refused to meet the press. He stayed hidden behind his followers, who passed out pamphlets explaining that Rozier had been framed. The bad publicity could destroy all that Mitchell had built. He hired a high-priced attorney and public relations expert. It was Mitchell's first step in creating a new image for his organization. Mitchell offered the attorney's legal help to Rozier. Rozier quickly realized that the attorney was there to protect the interests of Hulon Mitchell, not Rozier's. I don't want you 
but Rozier still refused to turn on the leader of the Yahwehs. Lieutenant Rex Remley recalls that the media attention prompted other insiders to talk. The media brought out different stories about people that had been inside the organization who wanted to speak about what had occurred. And it also brought other people to law enforcement who for maybe the first time realized that there was a significant reason at this point that people were being killed and it was time to come forward and tell what you knew. Investigators got a call from Oklahoma. One of Hulon Mitchell's relatives wanted to talk. She told them she'd witnessed a martial arts expert from New Orleans beaten to death by Yahweh's in 1983. She said Mitchell had ordered the beating. The young man's name was Leonard Dupree. Dupree was killed because Hulon Mitchell believed the man had been disrespectful. Detectives tracked down Dupree's mother in New Orleans. Hello, my name is Rex she confirmed that Leonard was a martial arts expert and had left home in 1983 to join the Yahwehs. But without a body or other evidence, investigators couldn't arrest Mitchell. While investigators were learning about Hulon Mitchell's dark secrets, he was opening his temple to the public. Water cooler's down the hall. Okay. To improve its image, Mitchell encouraged the most avid followers to take work in the community at large. But one avid member was beginning to change his mind about the leader he had followed so closely. For weeks, Robert Rozier sat behind bars, watching Hulon Mitchell distance himself further and further from the murder suspect. Then, in June of 1987, Mitchell formally excommunicated Robert Rozier on live TV. With the symbolic stroke of a marker, Mitchell had separated himself from Rozier permanently. Rozier had no one left to protect but himself. He decided to begin working with the FBI. It was the break agents were hoping for. Just after his transfer to federal prison, Rozier told investigators that he knew of at least 20 murders across the country that had been ordered by the Yahweh leader, Hulon Mitchell. To agents, it was clear that Mitchell hid behind organized religion as a front for organized crime. Rozier also explained why he and another man killed Anthony Brown and Rudy Broussard at the apartments in Opalaka. For Special Agent Herbert Cousins, it confirmed what he already suspected. Brown and Broussard were, were executed. That's pretty much what happened. Uh, they resisted being evicted from their homes, and they spoke out on TV against the Yahwehs. And uh, we were told that was the reason why they were murdered. Rozier also confessed to the murder of Raymond Kelly and another man whose ears had been cut off. Rozier told agents that the Yahweh leader directed him to kill as many white devils as possible and to return with an ear as proof. With Rozier, the FBI had a witness who could connect Hulon Mitchell to deadly violence. But because he was a killer himself, Rozier wasn't an ideal prosecution witness. U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs needed to find others willing to corroborate Rozier's stories. We just started traveling all over the country, uh, tracking down these individuals, trying to convince them to testify and to cooperate. One of the questions that we would get early on uh, from the witnesses or from the prospective witnesses was, will I be at risk uh, if I testify? Will something happen to me? Am I likely to get killed? It's the only time in my 22 years of experience 
that I have told people, because I felt like I had to tell them, is that yes, there is a chance uh, that you will suffer retribution. Hulon Mitchell fought the investigation by continuing to polish his public image. I'd like everybody to give a nice warm welcome. He continued to turn distressed buildings into gleaming properties. As Yahweh ben Yahweh, he toned down his anti-white message and made large contributions to popular causes. I think it'll make the area a better place. Watching Yahweh become stronger and stronger and watching him become more and more accepted by the community, I, as well as all of the investigators, felt he had to be stopped. Hulon Mitchell became a bigger-than-life public figure, enjoying all the legitimacy money could buy. He seemed unstoppable. After almost a decade of investigation, the FBI still lacked enough evidence to arrest self-proclaimed messiah Hulon Mitchell. Intimidation and murder had silenced most who dared to speak out against him. Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs had a difficult time persuading members to overcome their fear. I prayed with people, uh, I begged people, I cajoled people, uh, I urged them to do the moral thing, I urged them to, to do the ethical thing, uh, I urged them to fight a false religion and basically used every means I had available to me uh, to convince people to cooperate. Those bold enough to stand up against Hulon Mitchell, the man who called himself the okay. Son of God, okay. were placed under mind? witness protection. Do hereby proclaim Sunday, October 2nd, 1990, as Yahweh ben Yahweh did. As Mitchell continued to thwart the investigation privately, publicly, his legitimacy grew as Yahweh ben Yahweh. He's having photo op sessions with the mayor. Uh, the mayor proclaims Yahweh ben Yahweh day, and there are banners on the streets saying, you know, proclaiming Yahweh ben Yahweh day. In October 1990, despite his public successes, the FBI filed sealed arrest warrants for him and a dozen of his followers. They were kept secret to allow the FBI a month to plan the arrest. Agents dubbed the plan Operation Jericho. Special Agent Herbert Cousins knew it would be dangerous to take Yahweh Ben Yahweh in Miami since he was at the height of his popularity there. The main issue for law enforcement was safety. The safety of the individuals, the law enforcement members involved in the arrest, and also the safety of innocent uh, individuals and the safety of Yahweh members, including Yahweh ben Yahweh. Fortunately, Mitchell and others named in the indictment were scheduled to embark on a multi-city tour Yahweh ben Yahweh's first stop would be in New Orleans. The main arrest team would seize him at his hotel. Once he was in custody, teams in six other cities would capture his henchmen across the south. There were a number of arrest teams in different cities, several cities, Atlanta, North Carolina, New Orleans, Miami. I was sent to New Orleans to assist the New Orleans division with the arrest of uh, Yahweh ben Yahweh. On November 6, 1990, Hulon Mitchell arrived at the Monteleone Hotel in New Orleans. The FBI was already there. To track Mitchell's movements, undercover agents were posted on every floor. Coming up now. They're coming up. Throughout the South, teams took their positions outside Yahweh temples and waited for orders from Miami. Success depended on an unbroken flow of communication. 
The agents in Miami coordinated the entire operation. Everybody's ready to go. At 3 a.m., everyone was in place. They gave New Orleans the go-ahead. Agents in the hotel called Mitchell's room. The first instruction was that he instruct his bodyguard to turn himself into the agents who were waiting down the hall. Here comes the bodyguard. The second instruction was that he come out with his hands up and that he walk slowly down the hall. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Agents didn't know if Mitchell or his bodyguards were carrying weapons. Finally, their main suspect emerged. Hands on your head. Hands on your knees. They sent word to Miami. You're under arrest. Mitchell was captured. Murder. Go. Gotta go. The other teams swarmed in, arresting the criminal members of Mitchell's temple. In a matter of minutes, scores of agents mobilized to capture a dozen suspects across hundreds of miles. No one was hurt. We accomplished our goal. We arrested as many individuals as we could identify during the operation. And that's why I believe it, it was very successful. Yulon Mitchell was charged with extortion, conspiracy, and murder in aid of racketeering. Prosecutor Scruggs believed he was still dangerous. We found out that there was actually a hit team of five individuals uh, who were stalking us, trying to find out where we were so that they could kill us upon the orders of Yahweh bin Yahweh. At trial, his intimidation even penetrated the jury. We knew there were serious problems. We knew people were scared. Several jurors actually got dismissed prior to deliberations because they were scared to go back and deliberate. Perhaps it was fear that caused what prosecutors considered only a partial victory. In May 1992, Hulon Mitchell and six of his more violent followers were found guilty of conspiracy. But Mitchell himself received only 18 years in a maximum security federal prison. It had been a difficult case for investigators. He found a successful uh, philosophy that people would flock to and actually start joining and pledge their allegiance to him. And I think the more power he obtained, the more influence he, he obtained over his followers, that he ultimately lost control of himself. And he believed in his own mind he could do anything, even order life and death. Hulon Mitchell is locked away, his murderous actions halted by those who saw through his false gospel. <laughs>